I, I'm just so delighted to introduce our featured speaker today, Dr. Elizabeth Howell. Um, I first met Liz a few years ago, Dr. Howell, when she gave a compelling lecture at the American Gynecologic Obstetric Society. And she presently is chair of OBGYN at Penn. And I'm going to actually read her bio because I don't want to miss anything. So she was a founding director of the Blavitnik Family Women's Health Research Institute and vice chair of research uh, and associate dean for faculty development at the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai. She's an NIH-funded OBGYN health services researcher, and her major research interests lie at the intersection between quality of care and disparities in maternal and infant mortality and morbidity. She has served on several expert committees, including uh, the Institute of Medicine, NIH, the Joint Commission, ACOG, and International External Scientific Advisory Boards, she co-chaired the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health Working Group on Reduction of Peripartum Racial Disparities, served on the Governor's Task Force on Maternal Mortality and Disparate Racial Outcomes for New York State and the New York City Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Steering Committee for the New York City Department of Health, and finally has testified in Congress for maternal health care legislation. She has provided testimony to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights on Racial Disparities in Maternal Health and co-chair the National Quality Forum Committee on Maternal Morbidity and Mortality. She was recently invited to the White House by Vice President Harris to participate in a roundtable on Black maternal health. Many media outlets have featured Dr. Howell, including NPR, ProPublica, the NBC Nightly News, the Today Show, the New York Times, and Essence Magazine. She recently shared her research on quality of care, maternal mortality and morbidity, and racial and ethnic disparities in a TED Med talk that has garnered over 2 million views. So to say the least, we're so very fortunate to have Dr. Howell here to talk to us this morning. Dr. Howell? Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Dr. Um, Rice. You are a rock star and such a leader in our field, and it's just a privilege to be here today. I'd also take a, like to take a moment and thank uh, Dr. Sarto for her, uh, you know, legacy in, in, in starting the series here and all the work that she's been uh, doing. So it's really a privilege to be here today. I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen. Well, it's my pleasure to be here again today and talk to you a little bit about health equity and quality of care in the context of maternal morbidity and mortality. I just wanted to start by acknowledging and, and, and stating explicitly that I think we need to remember that our discussion today has implications for black, brown, and indigenous birthing people. And that in this talk, I will be talking about women to describe pregnant individuals, but I wanna make sure that the audience recognizes that I realize and wanna make sure to uh, uh, point out and, 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 and embrace the fact that people of various gender identities, including transgender, non-binary, and cisgender individuals give birth and receive maternity care. There has been a long legacy of racism and discrimination that has been experienced by Black women, and most of the research to date has been on cisgender women. We have a lot of work to do to expand our definitions and collect meaningful data on all birthing people. for some reason. Um, so I think that we all are aware, I think it was about 2010 when uh, Deadly Delivery uh, from um, uh, was, was published. And it was a, a story about maternal mortality and it started to bring attention to this topic. And then over the last uh, decade, 12 years, we've got had a lot more attention. And I think it was in 2017, 18, that ProPublica and NPR did that uh, joint series on um, uh, uh, deadly deliveries, or I, I think they, they reported out a number of different cases and, and sort of really uh, had a huge education campaign on making the United States and our public much more aware of these tragedies. Uh, and we saw this all over the news in New York Times, USA Today, 
And a lot of the, a lot of the stories were about how our healthcare system and hospitals were failing women. Our maternal mortality rate was noted to be high as compared to all other um, uh, uh, developed countries. And in fact, despite all the measurement uh, issues that we had, and just to remind you, uh, in 2003, a pregnancy checkbox was uh, added. And all of a sudden, prior to that, it was underreporting. And then the states implemented that pregnancy checkbox in, in the death certificate. Uh, over time, over about a 17 year period. So there was never a consistent way to measure. And finally, in 2018, the CDC, after it had been implemented in every state uh, uh, and they had done some validity checks, reported our, our, our maternal mortality rate again. At that point, it was 17.4. And what if you compared that 17.4 uh, uh, to other uh, countries, according to the World Health Organization's uh, latest maternal mortality ranking, the US would have been 55th um, just behind uh, Russia. So we have, uh, you know, notably very poor. Uh, I just want to remind the audience of um, what, you know, this maternal mortality that we're always talking about is it really something that the World Health Organization, it allows us to sort of compare ourselves um, to other countries. And um, next slide, please. One more time. And I just want to remind our, our audience of the definitions and just to remind ourselves that um, there are a couple of terms that we throw around quite a bit. Pregnancy associated mortality are deaths up to the um, first year postpartum from any cause. When we think of pregnancy related mortality, which is what the CDC uh, uses, and a lot of our data now really are from uh, pregnancy related mortality, we are also talking about deaths up to one year postpartum, but they're really pregnancy related. And then within that, a subset, which is maternal mortality, this sort of international, uh, we use that when we compare ourselves to other country and that 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 is, is used by the World Health Organization. And again, that's only up to 42 days. Next slide, please. When we think about pregnancy related mortality, so whether it's more maternal mortality or pregnancy related mortality, our rates have risen and our um, we're doing poorly overall. Next slide, please. So this is data from the CDC as was the, the previous slide, sort of just showing you the wide variation across the states, United States and in Washington, DC in terms of pregnancy related mortality. Next slide, please. And you can see here when you divide this in uh, tertiles, you could see that wide variation that some women are in states that are experiencing uh, pregnancy related mortality rates, you know, over twice that of in um, other states. Next slide, please. Back one, please. Thank you. So a big part of why we have such high rates of pregnancy related mortality in this country are the long standing racial and ethnic disparities in outcomes uh, for black versus white women. Here are some uh, important figures that I just wanted to share and remind you of their stories. So Dr. Shalon Irving was a um, CDC epidemiologist. Her story was in uh, the NPR ProPublica series. She was uh, 36, excuse me, she was 36 years old. She uh, had delivered her first uh, child by cesarean. She did have some complications, but was delivered, excuse me, but was discharged home. Three weeks later, she died from complications of hypertension. She was seen four or five times reportedly with elevated blood pressures during those three weeks by healthcare professionals. She was sent home and she died. So her story was has been this just horrific tragedy that um, uh, and has compelled her mother to have a major voice and start a, a nonprofit to sort of in her memory to really think about what can we do better so that we can we can reduce these uh, you know unnecessary and you know tragic deaths. In the lower left hand corner is Erica Garner. She was the daughter of Eric Garner, who was killed by the New York City police. Erica uh, turned out to be a big advocate against police brutality in New York City. She died three months following childbirth from a heart attack. And then uh, Rosa Diaz was a story that was again uh, done by ProPublica, uh, and it was a discussion of Medicaid policy in, in Texas. And in that story, they were talking about how lack of insurance and, and what that means for women. And she was a person who actually uh, 
hemorrhaged to death from an ectopic pregnancy and didn't was not able to uh, get care in time. Next slide, please. So here is data from the CDC summarizing pregnancy mortality uh, ratios by race and ethnicity from 2007 through 2016. And in this slide, you can see that uh, black women are two to three times more likely to die than uh, uh, white women from pregnancy related deaths. And it's very important to note that indigenous women also have elevated rates uh, more than twice that of uh, white women. Next slide. Some of these disparities are even more pronounced in some of our cities. For example, in wh where I used to work in New York City, black women um, in the most, uh, most recent uh, report by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene were eight times more likely to die than white women. And in that report, they noted that Asian and uh, uh, Latino uh, women also had elevated rates. Next slide, please. You know, an important part of the story is to acknowledge and realize that these disparities are not new. This has been going on for decades and decades. And here's a slide, um, actually, uh, Eugene de Klerk, uh, and, and this was published uh, for the Commonwealth Fund, but he's done a lot with data tracking over, over the years. And it's showing us that even in 1916, when it was first tracked, there was th these huge gaps. And remember, maternal mortality rates are going dramatically down from the early 1900s to about 1990 uh, through a number of help, you know, antibiotics, oxytocin, just a whole bunch of, uh, of changes in the way that we cared for women. But this gap, this black-white gap, just started to slowly increase and increase, showing us again that often when improvements happen, so, Populations that are the most marginalized often don't have the same uh, imp improvement in outcomes. Next slide, please. I want to remind the audience of, uh, of what we're talking about when we're talking about disparities. We're not talking about simple differences. I believe it was Margaret Whitehead in the um, 1990s uh, in, uh, um, in the United Kingdom that spoke about um, uh, health equity and she talked about it as a as a social justice issue and um, said it was something that was unjust. And here's a definition by Paula Braveman, who is a um, researcher at UCSF that I have always found helpful. Health equity and health disparities are intertwined. Health equity means social justice and health. No one is denied the possibility to be healthy for belonging to a group that has been historically that has historically been economically socially disadvantaged. Health disparities are the metric we use to measure progress towards achieving health equity. Next slide, please. I think many of us want to think that this is an issue of, um, you know, income and, 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 and it's all driven by socioeconomic status. However, the data from the CDC does not reflect that. In fact, Black women with a college education are more than five times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related death as compared to white women with a college education. Next slide. And they're over 1.5 times more likely to die than women uh, with white women with less than a high school education. Here is data again from the, um, the CDC uh, that's showing us that wide variation across the states, but showing us that no matter where you live in this country, these racial and ethnic disparities exist. And you can see that they're a little bit more pronounced in certain clusters, but black, the black to white gap is often around three. And we see the indigenous to white gap is from 1.7 to 3.3. Next slide, please. This is some data from um, um, the CDC that sort of summarized deaths from 14 uh, states from the Maternal Mortality Review Committees. And in this, they found, uh, they looked at the, the differences in the leading causes of pregnancy-related deaths. And you can see that cardiomyopathy was an, uh, a major killer of black women, cardiovascular conditions, preeclampsia. Interestingly, cardiovascular conditions were also a major cause for white women, but mental health conditions and thinking about um, uh, and those included substance use, uh, suicides, uh, were a major cause for white women. Next slide. And then when we think about this overall in the United States and we look at the data that's telling us the uh, leading clinical causes for pregnancy-related mortality, again, it's really cardiovascular disease, 
we can see infection and bleeding. And we also can notice that the trends are slowly changing and that we're not seeing, while high blood pressure is still a major, it, major cause, it's not as high as it used to be. Um, next slide, please. And then next slide. An important part of the story uh, is to always think about, uh, we've learned so much about the timing of pregnancy related deaths. You know, I think when we were, we used to always think of them as, you know, around antepartum, around delivery and just not, we didn't really focus on the postpartum period as much, but the data is really telling us that over half of these deaths are happening between day one postpartum and uh, at one year postpartum. And, and this really becomes very important also when we think about disparities, next slide, um, because um, that's really where you see a disparity is in these cardiomyopathy late postpartum uh, uh, deaths as well. Next slide, please. Here's data from, uh, again, from the CDC, just sort of helping us think about what are the underlying causes by timing of death. And you can see that the cardiovascular conditions during pregnancy, delivery day, it's hemorrhage and amniotic fluid embolism. In the early postpartum, we think about hemorrhage and hypertension. Later, we think about infection and car other cardiovascular conditions. And then in the late postpartum, again, we're thinking about cardiomyopathy, which is something that we see um, uh, is very disproportionate for black women. Next slide, please. But maternal death is really just the tip of the iceberg. And um, for every maternal death, I think this audience is well aware now of the data from the CDC talking about severe maternal morbidity, which um, was defined initially as life-threatening diagnosis or a life-saving procedure. Uh, and uh, this was uh, an, an, an index that was developed by Bill Callahan and um, really uh, talked about different diagnoses, things like organ failure, shock, amniotic embolism, eclampsia, and then procedures that were life saving, such as vent ventilation, transfusion, and hysterectomy in the setting of a severe hemorrhage. As has been documented over and over, our rates are actually increasing in this country and you can just go to the CDC website and they sort of have been tracking this now for the last uh, four or five years showing how we um, are continually increasing. Next slide please. Here's some data um, showing us um, how when we think about those clusters and now there are 21 categories that they uh, talk about it in terms of this index that the CDC uses to measure severe maternal morbidity that there are racial and ethnic uh, disparities within each of those categories like DIC, like heart failure. And you can see that black and indigenous women often have the highest rates within each of these clusters. Next slide, please. And now this is just data from the New York City um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on severe maternal morbidity in New York City. And the reason I brought this slide uh, and, and, and share this with you is just to remind you that the same thing we saw in terms of how education uh, that black women with a college education are more than five times as likely to die as white women with a, a, a college education. You see a similar trend here when you think about severe maternal morbidity. You can see that black women uh, with a college education on the right of your screen in pink have a much more elevated rate of um, severe maternal morbidity as compared with white women in, in, in yellow. You can also see that when you look at the left-hand side of your screen that, that, that black women with a college education on the right hand side as compared to white women uh, with less than a high school education on the left hand side of your screen in yellow, uh, black women are almost three times more likely than uh, white women with less than a, a high school education to experience uh, a severe maternal morbidity. Next slide, please. So how did we get here? Next slide, please. I think the story, and I think with what's happened with COVID and with uh, the George Floyd murder, there's been a growing recognition of the role of institutional racism in this country. And of course, maternal health care is no exception. I think it's an, an important exercise for us to think about all the ways in which historically uh, uh, structural racism has impacted um, health. We can start by thinking about the 1935 Social Security Act which included today's welfare benefits of unemployment and social security. It excluded individuals who worked farms or as domestic help. 
which remember were primarily jobs held by black Americans and people of color in the 1930s. So thus from its inception, it created a system where government aid was reserved primarily for white women, white people, excuse me. Next, many of you are familiar with redlining. In the 1930s, the government began the practice of redlining neighborhoods, which was based on how secure they were to invest in and redlined neighborhoods uh, with the highest risk. So not surprisingly, redlined areas were occupied by black families and those neighborhoods rarely qualified for federal housing assistance and they became underdeveloped and it created a cycle that deterred future investment. And so even though the practice was eventually banned, you see the effects today. And in fact, in New York City, um, you can, it is so closely tied to health outcomes. A, a, a publication, for example, in AJPH by the former commissioner, uh, Dr. Mary Bassett, uh, showed an association between historic redlining in New York City and the heightened risk of preterm birth in those neighborhoods. There are numerous reasons, and we've seen that with vaccine hesitancy, um, why uh, black women may mistrust the healthcare system because so many policies and practices were used to devalue them. We can think about the president of the AMA, Jerian, uh, James Marion Sims, who used to be called the father of gynecology, who performed multiple experimental surgeries without anesthesia on enslaved black women. The enforced eugenics programs that sterilized black women. Healthcare segregation continued into the mid 1960s with black families barred from certain hospitals even after the Civil Rights Act. So hospitals serving primarily folks of color were under-resourced and we continue to see this pattern today. And then finally, as I mentioned in the beginning of this slide was the tumultuous events of this last year, the disproportional impact of the COVID crisis on communities of color, the George Floyd murder, the election, and the storming of our US Capitol. These crises have put a spotlight on how systemic racism manifests in this country and how deeply entrenched it is in our society. Next slide, please. So what about um, the contribution of quality of care to racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care? So in 2002, there was a landmark publication by the Institute of Medicine called Unequal Treatment. It documented that there were racial and ethnic disparities in care across a range of illnesses and services, not much, if any, on maternal health, but we're talking a lot on cardiovascular care, stroke care, a number of areas in medicine. They also documented at that time that provider stereotype and bias contribute to these disparities and that people of color receive lower quality of care. Next slide, please. So let's remind ourselves what we mean when we talk about quality of care. According to the Institute of Medicine, the formal definition was the degree to which health services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge. And AHRQ defined it as doing the right thing for the right patient at the right time in the right way to achieve best possible results. Next slide, please. So the Institute of Medicine defined attributes of quality of care many years ago and talked about six attributes, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. Next slide. And equitable care uh, became one of the cross-cutting, next slide, cross-cutting uh, dimensions. And I just wanna say that, you know, Allison Bryan at MGH came up and kind of coined this no quality uh, without equity and that all quality improvement activities should integrate equity because if we don't do that and we don't think about it explicitly, we often allow uh, disparities to widen. And if we think about the true, uh, you know, it's what it, what is quality? It's reducing variation in care, right? So if we're not thinking about the, the, the causes, the underlying causes that increase variation, then we're really not doing our job. Next slide, please. Here is the definition of what equitable care means according to the RWJ. Care that does not vary in quality because of race, gender, income, or location. It may vary in practice because quality care, the right thing at the right time, is different for different people. And it ensures optimal outcomes for all patients, regardless of their background or circumstances. Next slide. And here's a slide from the RWJ 
just showing you the, the difference between equality, where everyone is receiving the same thing, versus equity, where people are getting what they need. Next slide, please. So in our field, there's growing evidence that um, quality of care is an underlying cause of racial and ethnic disparities, that quality of care varies across delivery hospitals, and that site of care is receiving increasing attention as a mechanism for disparities. There's also growing evidence that within hospital disparities also exist. Next slide, please. So I'm a health services researcher, and we often wanna have a conceptual model as we approach how we think about a, an issue. And here you can see structural racism and discrimination on the left. You can think about patient, community, clinician, and system factors. You can think about things like social, socio-demographics, education, poverty, language, beliefs, health behaviors, psychosocial issues, stress, weathering hypothesis, the idea that um, black women are, um, uh, because of the, the chronic stress of racism and discrimination in this country, um, it has detrimental impact uh, on their uh, reproductive re reproduction and, and child outcomes. You can think about community and neighborhood factors, social network, built environment, housing, clinician factors, knowledge, experience, cultural humility and communication, and then system factors, access to high quality care, transportation, policy. These all combine uh, for when a, a woman is pregnant, a birthing person is pregnant, and um, you can think about the comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, that all place them at an elevated risk. They interact with us pre during the preconception period, antenatal, delivery and hospital care and postpartum care. And ultimately, they have a result of a severe maternal morbidity or mortality as an outcome. Next slide, please. I'm going to share now a little bit about some of the work that we've done uh, in the context of thinking about delivery and hospital care, but reminding you that I think one of the fundamental things that we're, we need to remind ourselves is this sort of care continuum, that it's these disparities are happening across a life course, are happening preconception, antenatal delivery and postpartum. And if we're going to intervene, uh, we need to think about all uh, of these different time points. Next slide, please. Another point I just want to make sure that we remind ourselves are about is the fact that maternal deaths are thought to be, uh, the majority of them are thought to be preventable. And we've seen this over and over again from maternal mortality review boards. We saw this, we've seen this in Europe. We've seen this in uh, a number, in the CDC report that greater than 60% of, of these deaths are, are, are thought to be preventable. Next slide, please. Which makes quality of care a critical lens uh, and a critical factor to uh, uh, um, think about when we're trying to address these uh, um, these deaths and severe maternal morbidities. Next slide, please. So we've gotten some NIH funding to uh, think about the ways in which hospital quality contribute to racial and ethnic disparities and severe maternal morbidity, and um, we had four phases to this study. Uh, Quant the first phase were quantitative analyses to examine hospital risk adjusted severe maternal morbidity and the racial and ethnic distribution of deliveries. The second phase were qualitative interviews to examine safety culture, quality improvement, and other factors that may explain variation in hospital performance. Third phase was focus groups with uh, women who actually experienced a severe maternal morbidity during their delivery hospitalization to better understand barriers to uh, receipt of high quality care. And then the final phase was a dissemination effort to increase uptake of best practices. Next slide, please. So we linked birth certificate data from New York City with state discharge abstract data, which is all the sort of ICD-9 codes for the years of 2011 through 14. We used that CDC metric that I've spoken to you about to identify severe maternal morbidity. We use mixed effects logistic regression to calculate risk standardized severe maternal morbidity rates for each hospital. We ranked the hospitals according to this metric, and we assessed black-white differences and Latina-white differences in delivery location. Next slide, please. We uh, adjusted these models for sociodemographic characteristics, for clinical and obstetric factors, and for maternal comorbidities. Next slide, please. Severe maternal morbidity rates, the observed rates in New York City during this time period, you can see that black women were not quite almost three times as likely as white women to experience severe maternal morbidity, and Latino women were twice as likely. Next slide, please. So again, we ranked the hospitals 
um, by um, risk-adjusted severe maternal morbidity from lowest to highest. And here you can see the take-home point here is that there was, you know, six-fold variation in risk-adjusted rates of this outcome across New York City hospitals after accounting for patient case patient case mix. And remember, birth certificate data has self-identified race ethnicity, it has maternal education, it has where you were born, whether in the United States or not in the United States. It has a lot of rich sociodemographic factors that we were able to incorporate in this risk adjustment model. Next slide, please. We next divided the hospitals in tertiles based on this um, risk adjusted uh, rates, low morbidity, medium, and high. Next slide, and then we looked at the racial distribution um, of deliveries across those hospitals. So in this slide, you can see that of all the black women delivered in this period, 23% delivered in mobor low morbidity hospitals. You can see that in the light blue, as opposed to 65% of white women and 33% of Latinx. In contrast, 37% of uh, black deliveries occurred in the high morbidity hospitals while only 18% of white deliveries occurred in those hospitals and 29% of Latinx. So we did a simulation and we asked, well, what happens if black women go to hospitals in the same proportion as white women? So we don't change anything about the black woman, nothing about her, her BMI, whether she, whether she has high blood pressure, her age. The only thing we change is whether she goes to the same hospitals as white women do. So if 10% of white women delivered in that lowest morbidity hospital, 10% of black women delivered there. If the next 5% of white women delivered in the, in the next lowest hospital, 5% of black women. We did it across the whole distribution and then we did that exercise a thousand times just to get a stable estimate. And we found, next slide, that, that up to 48% of the black white disparity and up to 37% of the Latinx white disparity could be explained by differences in delivery hospital. Next slide, please. So next we went on to phase two. We wanted to understand, the first question was, why is there six-fold variation in these hospitals? And remember, New York City, all the hospitals are you know, fairly high volume. You have the vast, vast majority. I think uh, uh, I think there were, uh, there's one that was not, two, one or two that were not of the 39 hospitals that weren't. Teaching hospitals, it was a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it is a, you know, high urban population. And so, what is it about these hospitals that might uh, explain the differences? Because the traditional things, teaching status, NICU level, um, volume of deliveries, um, while they are associated with the outcome, they didn't explain that wide variation. So we said, let's go in and talk to people. Let's find out. Uh, Think about things like structural characteristics, what might be different about hospitals across the spectrum, organizational factors such as culture, leadership. What about clinical processes? And then their views on patient outcomes. Next slide, please. And we layered that with a discussion on disparities, bias, diversity, communication, and families. Next slide, please. We used a positive deviance framework. So you saw how we ranked the hospitals uh, into the three groups. We selected four hospitals from the high morbidity group and four hospitals from the low morbidity group. And the additional criteria that we looked at is we, we tried to the best that we could to think about percent uh, black and, uh, uh, and Latina, percent Medicaid, so that, that when possible, could we compare a hospital that was high Medicaid, that had a high risk-adjusted severe maternal morbidity, and a hospital that was high Medicaid that had a low risk-adjusted severe maternal morbidity, and were there any lessons we could learn? Now, remember, we only had a very small sample of hospitals, but th that, those were kind of the thinking that we had. Next slide, please. We did this in eight hospitals. We conducted 50 interviews. They were set semi-structured. Uh, we interviewed, you know, all the folks were consented. We uh, audio taped and transcribed, and I worked with a qualitative research team, uh, and the qualitative research team uh, was blinded to the hospital rankings. Next slide. This just sort of gives you a flavor of who we spoke to, chairs, physician directors of L&D, physician nurse quality lead, nurse managers, frontline nurses, chief medical officer, and then a couple of other uh, types of, um, uh, of, of folks. Next slide, please. And um, this is just to sort of give you a sense that we divided the hospitals in these clusters. Uh, we analyzed the themes by cluster without knowing a priori about performance. And so we had the qualitative research team do this. We wanted to see if we could 
not be blinded, let them be blind, you know, let them, uh, we didn't want them to know where the ranking was. Neither did the hospital when we came in. So when I we went in to do the interviews, I was the only one who knew whether they were a high morbidity or a low morbidity. The qualitative researcher did not. Next slide, please. So here were some similar, there were some a lot of similar themes in New York City across hospitals, whether they were high or low performing. Uh, you know, everyone believed that communication was a critical factor, but they varied dramatically in what they were doing. Uh, people really didn't think much about the care being delivered when they thought about maternal morbidity right, rates increasing. They really thought thought about factors outside of the hospital uh, as a as a as a underlying causes. Everyone had some issues around nurse staffing issues, shortages. And again, this was 2017, 18 before COVID. So the, all these nursing shortages were, were still a, a, a major issue. Um, there was wide variation in quality measurement and improvement in, in, in the uh, resources used to address this within the hospitals. And individual adverse events were more likely to lead to quality improvement than monitoring trends. And at that time, and I think there's been a lot of progress since, no one was analyzing the data to compare performance across race, ethnicity, or insurance type. Next slide, please. And high performing hospitals, here were the themes that we found. Those hospitals that had low risk adjusted severe maternal morbidity. There was more of a focus on standards and standardized care. There was a stronger effort on nurse physician uh, communication and teamwork. There was more sharing of performance data with frontline folks that the senior leadership was more likely to be involved with day-to-day -day quality activities. And there was more of an awareness that disparities and racism may be present in the hospital and could lead to differential treatment. Next slide, please. So next we just did focus groups. We did three focus groups, again, with Black and Latino mothers and um, who had experienced, uh, we did these focus groups with Black, we had three, a focus group, by self-identified race. So we had a black group, we had a Latinx group, and we had a white non-black and Latino group, essentially. Um, so we had some white and Asian women in that group. Um, again, all these women had experienced severe maternal morbidity, and then we, exp we explored how they experienced care. Next slide. And you can see the main themes were that it was a very traumatic experience, and I think that there's a lot more acknowledgement of, of this in the, in the last couple of years. This, this idea of poor communication that they just rushed me to the OR. I was just lying there, I'm cold, I'm shaking, I'm not feeling good, but nobody's telling me anything. Uh, not feeling heard, which you heard from Serena Williams and from so many women uh, in the last three or four years about having to you know, take care of themselves in the hospital and essentially diagnose their, uh, their own ailments. And then the Black and Latina groups really talked a lot more about access being limited, the majority of them were on Medicaid or Medicaid uh, managed care in our in our of the people we had in our focus groups. And they felt that there was less time spent on education and, and a lack of continuity of care. Next slide, please. So we've also done some work, you know, that previous work really talked to you about um, uh, how between hospital differences is part segregation of care between hospital differences part of this story. But we also wonder, because in New York City, we have a lot of um, uh, resident clinics that are primarily Medicaid uh, patients are seen, and there's there was a lot of thought at the time about a two-tiered system. And so we wondered, well, uh, and a lot of people thought that that was what was driving uh, uh, these disparities. And if that were the case, you would expect to see within hospital disparities and that that would be likely associated with insurance type. So we examined this question uh, and uh, next slide, please. We use logistic regression to produce risk adjusted rates of severe maternal morbidity patients. And then we just did uh, paired T tests to sort of see whether there were differences. And next slide, both for black versus white, and next slide, and for Latino versus white, we found that there were significant racial and ethnic di uh, differences within hospital, again, after accounting for insurance type. So there are differences, but those differences were not driven by insurance type. And in fact, what we found is that if you were commercially insured and you were a Medicaid uh, insured by Medicaid, your 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 the your risk of having a severe maternal morbidity event within any given hospital was similar. There was no statistically significant difference. There was a difference, and this is not what I'm going to show you, but the, there was still this notion that uh, 
that at the hospital level, the higher proportion of Medicaid patients you had, the higher your rate was as a maternal morbidity, but not at the patient level. Next slide, please. So um, I had a colleague who um, did some work um, thinking about um, whether obesity was really, uh, you know, a lot of people want to talk about comorbidities being the reason and the explanation for why black women have higher rates of severe maternal morbidity. Next slide. And basically, um, she demonstrated that 3 to 15 percent, so only a small percentage of the association between race and um, or ethnicity uh, and severe maternal morbidity was actually mediated by pre-pregnancy obesity, indicating that other factors, we needed to think about other factors. Next slide. My colleague Teresa uh, Jonovic did some uh, really nice work uh, examining whether racial and economic uh, spatial polarization uh, and racial and economic segregation, in other words, is associated with SMM rates uh, in New York City and used the index of concentration of the extremes, which is a measure that's being often used uh, as a way to monitor um, population health inequities and found that women in zip codes with the highest concentration of poor blacks relative to wealthy whites, because remember it's at both economic and race um, segregation, that experienced uh, nearly more than twice as likely to experience severe maternal morbidity than neighborhoods with white women uh, who were in, in wealthier neighborhoods. What was so interesting about that study was a, um, she did a blog um, and showed this map. So you can see uh, the map here in red, which is really the neighborhoods in New York City with the highest rates of severe maternal morbidity. Well, and the reason I always show this slide is it just really, you can overlay it on the COVID maps when you look at New York City. So just showing you how much these factors really contribute. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Next slide, please. Again, I talked about this life course and this care continuum. Next slide. So in the preconception period, we know that it's really important for us to promote sort of culturally appropriate, sensitive, you know, patient-informed choices around contraception, and then to optimize preconception health. Next slide. We know about a number of new care models centering medical homes. We're learning more and more about new and novel ways to engage patients. Next slide, please. We know a lot about quality and safety in the labor and delivery unit, team training, simulations, bundles. And I think there's a growing recognition of the importance of disparities dash dashboards of looking at our quality metrics by race and ethnicity, and, and then uh, implementing quality improvement to target uh, those findings. Next slide. And new models around postpartum care and how we engage women, whether it's patient navigators, community health workers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. But we have to also remember that it's not just about these things. We have to do more. We need to think about both implicit and explicit bias and having you know, an active role by our healthcare systems in trying to address this, mechanisms for reporting, et cetera. Next slide. We need to think about the ways that we can enhance communication, not only with our patients, but among ourselves. Next slide. And we need to think about the ways that we can integrate community more in our patient quality and safety efforts. Next slide, please. And one more slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is the patient safety bundle by the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, uh, reduction of peripartum racial and ethnic disparities. Next slide, please. And a summary um, of this really is some of the main steps that we recommended that I think a number of hospitals have done, but there are a lot of steps that folks have not done. So I think it's really important for us to be uh, gathering self-identified race and ethnicity, the disparities dashboards that I talked about, providing more education on shared decision-making, implicit bias training, including community members and quality committees, which I don't think we've done, have made as much progress on, and uh, promoting a culture of equity similar to the way that we um, uh, promote a culture of safety. We also need to create mechanisms for reporting racism and disrespect. Next slide, please. Also um, works with the CDC in a working group on um, maternal mortality review committees. Uh, they were reporting that the role of bias in maternal death uh, was coming up over and over again, but there was no distinct category for bias on the form. And remember the Maria form is a, an attempt by the CDC so that they can collect uh, uniform data from across the states uh, so they can have standardized documentation of the 
causes of deaths uh, in uh, of maternal deaths across uh, all the maternal mortality review boards. And so uh, this is really important for them to be able to aggregate the data. And there were no, they while they were had done some work on including social determinants, there was nothing on racism. So our goal was to really document how people could do that and provide recommendations on how to prevent pregnancy related deaths when bias is a contributing factor. Next slide, please. So we came up with definitions on discrimination, interpersonal racism and structural racism, which are now part of the Maria form. Next slide, please. The last phase of that research that I was talking to you about before that we had done for this NIH was a health equity summit we held last January. And we got a number of not only our research team, but a number of people. We had folks from Georgia do, who are doing really innovative work. Karen Scott from UCSF, who's doing really in innovative work around how you measure discrimination uh, and obstetric racism. Um, a bunch of researchers, community uh, organizations to come together to talk about, you know, what have we learned and where do we go next? And can we share best practices? Some of the themes that came up were acknowledging the role of structural racism, this life course approach, the fact that we, we really do need to think about the maternal infant diet if we're going to ever interrupt the intergenerational transmission of health disparities, that we do need to advocate for social dis, um, justice. We had um, the head of Vermont Oxford Network, which is the largest registry for uh, infants less than 1500 grams, Jeffrey Horber, who was a part of this summit. And he talked about a lot of the work that they were doing as is about not ignoring social risk, but actually acting on it. I think in medicine, we often often think of things outside of our um, doors. And I think it's only over the last few years we're starting to realize we can't think that way anymore. Engaging community and then Allison Bryant from the MGH was there uh, and I put her her coin, her term of no quality without equity. Action steps were really thinking about policies to disband mental structural racism, integrating black and women, black and brown women's lived experience. Again, promoting a culture of equity, listening to women, integrating equity lenses for learners, thinking about um, supporting doulas, including Medicaid coverage, addressing the midwifery shortage, and again, advocacy in these disparities dashboards. Next slide, please. Here are some of the things we're doing at Penn. Uh, and uh, so, Penn, before I got here, had done some um, interesting work in this space and had started on this journey. Um, and in the last year, I'm just sort of summarizing what we've been doing, uh, which has been really exciting. So for the first year uh, here, uh, as part of our Penn Medicine team leadership goals, so that's something across all of the health system for the leaders, uh, which these goals are usually things like readmissions and SSIs and, and those kinds of things, reducing rates. We had a, a goal of reducing maternal morbidity and mortality among black women. We did that across the five delivery hospitals, had working groups, uh, meeting monthly, targeting, uh, and I don't have enough time to go into all the details, but we've had a tremendous amount of success. It also really helped build a lot of systemness here around sort of engaged on a mission based goal together. Um, so very exciting and I'm incredibly excited about that work. Um, We've implemented our department's 100% staff and and um, and depart uh, and faculty implicit bias trainings. Again, I'm not sure how much a one time implicit bias training helps us, but we're starting that journey. Uh, and I think we need to do more work in thinking about that. Um, prior, uh, we had a, a, a health equity committee before I got here and they had started uh, integrating speaker series into our grand rounds uh, and also a book group. And so there's a book group here uh, and have read, you know, we had a Dorothy Roberts, uh, who's here for UPenn Law, uh, Killing the Black Bodies, her book, and then had her come as a speaker as one example. Talked about these um, at all our quality forums, which are our equivalent of maternal morbidity and mortality, excuse me, our, our, our um, morbidity um, uh, discussions that we have every month to talk about our cases, we, we incorporate a disparities index. Um, we've, they've done a lot of innovative programs here before I got here and continue now using technology to try to improve and re uh, quality and reduce disparities. There's a program here called the Heart Safe Motherhood Program that's done a lot of work of texting women who have high blood pressure following delivery, sending them home with a blood pressure cuff and, and getting them back into care or 
controlling their blood pressure and have had dramatic reductions in, in postpartum readmissions as well as ED visits and much better uh, follow-up in terms of getting blood pressures checked. We have a vice chair of diversity, equity, inclusion that we appointed this last year. Uh, and uh, we're working on a better ways of having mechanisms and reporting for, for patients, um, but um, been trying. There are a number of different um, reporting mechanisms, but that's an area that we continue to work on. And then our, our, our um, at a higher level than the department, our faculty across the system have an anti-racism leadership committee that our, our department faculty are very active in. Last slide, please. So I'd just like to end by saying, uh, sharing this quote by Lisa Cooper, who's a professor at Hopkins and is a person who's been working in this area for a long time. Most health disparities are avoidable. They result from decisions we make as a society regarding how we allocate our resources and how much injustice we are willing to accept as a fact of life. Next slide, please. I'd like to end by just thanking uh, my research team that I've worked with for years on that work. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it, it takes a village to do the work uh, and, and to do sort of uh, uh, research. And I've been working with them for years and they've been are, are just instrumental in, in, in the research that um, I was able to share with you today. OK, thank you. Liz, thank you. My breath is kind of taken away right now. I got to be honest with you. Um, Dr. Kitty Sampanay Samp is going to run the Q&A session. She is one of our um, chairs of our DEI committee and has and continues to do an amazing job. But let me just say thank you for the work and, and the talk before I turn it over to her. I really appreciate both. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Dr. Howell. That was a really great talk, and I've um, learned a ton listening today. Um, I'm just going to help moderate the Q&A session. Um, we have about 10 to 12 minutes, and um, individuals can place any comments or questions in the chat, or you can also choose to unmute and speak up if you would like. Hi, Luther Gaston. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, did you find any difference in outcomes between uh, patients care for in terms of gender or ethnicity or race of the providers? So really good and important question, but with the data that we had, we were unable to answer that question. So we did not have, we were not able to get at race and ethnicity um, uh, of the providers in the in the in the you know we were using birth certificate and state discharge abstract data and we had actually looked into sort of seeing can we get provider type on this we couldn't get down and we the data wasn't in good enough shape for us to actually look at that question but we think uh, it's an important question. Thank you. Another question: Did you find there was a link between low performing hospitals and low performing schools in those communities? So another great question in that I think that, you know, we know these neighborhoods, we see the data from from COVID showing us a lot of, you know, uh, uh, things that we notice. And as I mentioned, that severe maternal morbidity in New York City really closely is linked with that. We specifically did not look at the educational levels, but there's no question that when we look at using that ICE, in, you know, my colleague I mentioned used this um, ICE index that is sort of a measure of racial and economic um, segregation because it combines them and it's the way people have been using to look at um, the way that segregation may impact outcomes. When you look at that and you look at the neighborhoods with the highest, remember you're comparing neighborhoods that have the highest proportion of black, low income uh, folks versus neighborhoods that are the, have the um, highest proportion of white, high income uh, patients. So that's what you're really comparing. You do find not only severe maternal morbidity is higher in those neighborhoods, but you find, you know, a lot of these indices that people look at in terms of education levels of the neighborhoods, et cetera, are, 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 are lower. <clears throat> what do you think about uh, tracking individual physician data on race in addition to institutional data? Uh, on racial uh, and gender outcomes. So, you know, I, I 
mostly am familiar with the New York City uh, data. And again, it wasn't great data to, you know, for example, we're doing a much better job in, in New York State because the, the Department of Health, the, there was a mandate around the collection of race and ethnicity. And so we have, you know, we have to, people are really encouraged to do self-identified race, ethnicity, and sort of improve that state discharge abstract data at the patient level, right? And at the birth certificate level, we feel really good because we know it was the mom who filled that out. But in terms of the provider level and the quality of that data, first of all, I don't believe there was race ethnicity that we could even get our hands on, but also that just the quality of, of, of making sure provider type is always tricky, right? So, you know, is it the delivery provider? Is it the antenatal provider? Like you can't get at any of the sort of nuance at all, you have to do a chart review. You did not do chart reviews. And I'm not even sure chart reviews will fully get you there sometimes because of all of these factors. Um, so that 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 it's an important question. I just haven't figured out the right data source uh, or the right way to think about that um, for us, given all of these, um, given all those factors. And you're right, I don't feel any more comfortable being a physician. Um, walked into any hospital ultrasound like I had last week than anybody walking uh, off the street of a ghetto. Uh, I don't think I, you know, get any more respect. Um, and uh, 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 and, and be, to be honest with you, uh, it's very, uh, you know, disconcerting uh, because you have to walk in and think, are you going to be treated differently just because you look differently? And you shouldn't have to do that. And you know that it's, it's such an important point. And the other thing I'll just share with this audience is, as you said that, it reminded me when we did the focus groups, the other thing, I don't think people understand how hard it is. And I, I think Charles Johnson, if you ever heard him speak about his story of his wife, his wife passed away from uh, uh, from a death. She was super healthy, marathon runner. Um, she was, a, this was a, a black, the, both the couple was black mm -hmm. and she died uh, from a hemorrhage. And mm -hmm. he was watching, you know, she was healthy, had a section, came back, and she, he was watching her, her foley. He was watching the blood, and he couldn't get people. And he was trying to sort of, it was so hard for him because he didn't want to come across as the angry black man, but he was so worried about his daughter and, I mean, excuse me, about his wife. And he was, you, when you hear him talk about it, it was so compelling. And then when I did focus groups and you hear women talk about how their partners are treated in these settings, it is so hard for folks because they want the best and they're and they're just anxious like everyone else and you you don't get that same benefit often and i i've i've heard that what you just talked about that theme in so many different ways uh from our patients mm -hmm. thank you thank you um i have a question about the disparities dashboard that you've been mentioning um i think we're all somewhat familiar with dashboards i'm just wondering if you can um kind of make it a little more real and share maybe like an example of um, something that you've seen on a disparities dashboard or worked on or how you've approached it from a QI standpoint so we can kind of get a better idea of how to apply it in our in our institutions. So we have a, I have a, a colleague here, um, Sindhu Srinivas, who's done a lot of work on developing the dashboards um, for us. And um, now it's available for all five delivery hospitals. So one of the great things about this Penn Medicine team goal is not only do we have the dashboard, but we got a lot of infrastructure. When you when you when the top says something is important, then you get the data. You know, you get your data needs met, which is really also helpful. So what what she what we were always uh, doing at our hospital, but not not every hospital had that was looking just your tip NTSV rate, right? Like your elective delivery, your 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 uh, your third and fourth degrees, your postpartum, you know, blood loss of greater than X, whatever you guys, you know, all of those things were being measured through the uh, medical record, through Epic. So we have those. Now we have the ability to stratify it by race and ethnicity. So we can see what those rates are for each group. We have the ability to stratify it by insurance type. So we have our, you know, 10 metrics we have the ability to go in and look by race and ethnicity. And now um, all five delivery hospitals have that ability. So we feel like that's a beginning step in this process. I think the key is not to just look at it, <laughs> but to actually do something if you find it or if there's something. And then I think the other thing that's been really helpful, which again, um, I give credit to the uh, uh, 
our vice chair of equity and uh, um, diversity, equity and inclusion, Dr. Abike James, who uh, really championed this with another colleague in the department around this disparity index idea. It's not perfect because you can't. It's not an adjusted. It's just an observed, right? And you know, they're all we can we can have a long discussion about that. Um, but at least it makes people aware and they start thinking about, you know, and if something looks outrageous, you know, what is that? Why is that happening? And so I think it's a beginning of because part of this is about just having a discussion and an awareness and talking it and that it matters. You know, so many years as a person who's worked in this field for like 15 years, for so many years, you kept saying it and nobody, nobody thought it mattered. And I just feel like I'm so grateful that we finally come to the point that people realize this. This is just because this has been around for so long that it matters and and, and having, um, you know, having the residents and the, you know, the trainees understand that it's you, you just can't you, you have a responsibility um, it, it is a change. And so we have a long ways to go, but it's a beginning and a, and a start. And I'm, I'm very optimistic. Great, thank you. Um, I think Dr. Anthony has uh, my feel free to unmute and um, comment or a question that you might have. I just have a quick comment. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that um, one of my colleagues who can't be here today um, has started a program where she does like remote telehealth monitoring for blood pressures. Um, and she started this several years ago and it's um, been a huge success. Um, she um, essentially approaches patients who have any kind of hypertensive disorder and monitors their blood pressure via like a Bluetooth enabled um, uh, blood pressure cough with like a tablet and um, those blood pressures are relayed to a nurse. Um, they adjust their medications and then at six weeks um, the device is returned. Um, and it's proven to be cost effective and reduces, you know, hospital readmissions and um, has presumably possibly saved lives, you know, um, hard to tell for sure. But um, she's been uh, applying for grants to scale this up across the state, but um, thought it might be nice for you guys to connect since it sounds like you have, um, you know, some programs that you're building for, you know, postpartum um, blood pressure monitoring, and um, she can show you how to do it in a cost effective and very awesome way. Um, her name is Dr. Kara Hoppy, and she's in a much needed vacation, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> she. Well, thanks for sharing that. And in fact, um, the Heart Safe Motherhood program, which is um, Dr. Doctors and D. Hirschberg here and uh, Srina Vass, who started it. I'm sure there's a lot. It sounds like there's a lot of similarity of overlap. Yeah, there's a fair amount of overlap, but it would be nice to sort of see, you know, what what the play. I'm happy to connect them to see what, you know, they probably there's some shared lessons that the, that the, that the two groups could think about because they've actually been successful um, scaling this up across our health system. So we have Heart Safe Motherhood at all five delivery hospitals. And then the Department of Health here in Philadelphia got a grant uh, to, 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 to actually um, uh, imp implement it across all the delivery hospitals in Philadelphia. So they've had a lot of promise with it and um, continue. Um, so it's very exciting. And, and, and now we're doing things, you know, in the, you know, around this space and we're doing some a program called healing at home and getting people out of the hospital earlier all sort of leveraging technology as a way to sort of improve outcomes improve experience um and what we found which was really interesting is uh you know with the telehealth and uh covid crisis right we found that actually our no-show rate for our medicaid patients went w way down Again, reminding us about how, you know, if you actually make it easy for people to, to, to connect with you, they will and they want to. It's just that there are all these other barriers that maybe we don't always think about that prevents them. So it was then it was interesting. We didn't find the same uh, no show rate decrease uh, in our commercial insurance population, but their their rate was lower. But still, it was interesting. Thanks. The, the thing with the telehealth, though, I did meet with Dr. Hoppe about that. There were still disparities with African Americans and much less uptake. And so I think that one of the things in, in, in uh, Dr. Dulo, um, in her paper, is that there basically is no, essentially no basis for uh, genetics in terms of race, is that in her pr proposal, is that we're not going to be able to deal with a lot of these issues without social determinants of health. And um, and I, I totally agree with her. Um, the um, I mean, we have a three point five trillion dollar uh, infrastructure budget that could significantly help uh, some of the inner city areas, um, and and it's being pretty much blocked right now. Um, the there's a link I think between not only poor performing high school hospitals and and patients, 
I think there's a link between poor performance schools and poor performance students. And so that, that then tracks to poor incomes, poor insurance and everything else. Um, so we're gonna have to get at the core root of the problem, um, uh, which is to improve some of these determinants uh, because it's not going to matter if these African American women won't uptake it in, in Madison, which they had trouble uh, with our, our group here uptaking the uh, the um, telehealth. Um, I am going to uh, introduce next Dr. Elizabeth Burnside. She is a professor in the UW Madison Department of Radiology. She's the deputy director of the UW Institute for Clinical Translational Research and the associate dean for interdisciplinary research in team science in the School of Medicine and Public Health. She's also one of the PIs for the UW um, BIRCWH program. Um, and uh, Dr. Burnside is going to uh, introduce Dr. Meyerson. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Great, uh, thank you. and thanks for the nice introduction. So that that um, last component was the, I'm one of three PIs for the Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health, or the BIRCH program. So very relevant um, in my next uh, words, because I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Rebecca Meyerson as a featured speaker today um, in the UW Women's Health and Health Equity Research Symposium. Dr. Meyerson holds a doctorate in public policy from the University of Chicago with a concentration in applied econometrics. In 2018, she received the Health Economics and Outcomes Research Excellence in Application Award from the International Society for Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research, or ISPOR, a huge honor. She joined the UW School of Medicine and Public Health in the Department of Population Health Sciences in 2019, and she was appointed, um, I'm thrilled to say, as a UW Birch Scholar in 2020. Dr. Meyerson's work examines the impact of public policy on disparities in health outcomes. She's published numerous outcome articles in high impact uh, peer reviewed journals and her research has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, CBS News, the NBC Nightly News, and cited by the Congressional Budget Office. So she does great research and gets the word out. She's received funding from UW-Madison, private foundations, and the Agency for Research on Healthcare Quality, and that's just to start uh, in order to sustain her exceptional research program. Uh, Dr. Meyerson's long-term goal, I'm happy to say I've, I've heard her talk about it, is inspiring, is to become an in independent investigator whose research reduces disparities in outcomes by providing evidence for policy improvements. Her talk today, entitled Medicaid Expansion, Increased Preconception Health Counseling, Folic Acid Intake, and Postpartum Contraception, provides insights to her policy work that powerfully advances women's health and health equity research. So without further ado, Dr. Meyerson. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm really delighted to be here and sharing slides now. Um, thank you uh, uh, to Dr. Rice, Dr. Sarto for the invitation, Dr. Burnside for the kind introduction, uh, and Drs. Temkin and Howell. I learned so much from your presentations and uh, it's really wonderful to be able to interact with you even in this online environment. Um, thank you everyone. So um, first, a couple of acknowledgements. Um, I would like to thank the PRAMS Working Group as well and the uh, CDC uh, for assistance in accessing and interpreting the PRAMS data. Um, I would like to acknowledge my funding through the BIRCH program. Um, the content here is the responsibility of the authors does not necessarily represent the official views of NIH. Um, and as Dr. Hall mentioned as well, um, it's important to acknowledge that while we do use the word women in, in the paper to talk about birthing individuals, uh, we recognize that there are a variety of identities that people may have. Um, and apologies for the shorthand in this, in this particular case. So uh, this, this, in this presentation of this, this uh, paper, we focus on preconception health and uh, reproductive, uh, which we believe to be important for reproductive outcomes. So let me orient you to this topic and then we'll zoom in on the particular 
policy solution that we are looking at. Um, so as Dr. Hull mentioned, um, there is higher maternal and uh, as well infant mortality in the United States and other high income countries. And uh, this is concentrated um, on women in lower income communities. In, in the case of this paper, we'll focus on uh, a policy intervention that's targeted, but based on income specifically. Um, and we, we, we thought that there, uh, among many ways to uh, try to address this problem, what uh, one, one potentially helpful angle is uh, that Im improving the health of birthing people prior to conception and between pregnancies can be crucial to improving these outcomes. Um, and that um, myself, I'm a non-clinician and um, others in the audience know so much more than me about this, but um, just to cite a couple of examples, um, focusing on some of the preconception health indicators that we, we, we uh, study in this paper that were selected by a national committee, uh, for example, uh, lack of folic acid intake uh, in, in the um, early early weeks of development and prior to conception uh, can be a risk factor for uh, 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 neural tube defects. Uh, so that that is something that must be addressed uh, oftentimes before someone even knows that they're pregnant. Um, in addition, management of chronic conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. Um, Ideally, it could start in the preconception period. Uh, they, uh, these are conditions that may be really hard to, uh, it, may, it may take a, a lot of titrating of medication and it may be complex to manage. It may be a little bit late in the game to start trying to manage that once someone already realizes that they're pregnant, which uh, may be six weeks in and then gets on Medicaid coverage, which may take some time as well. Um, Maintaining a healthy weight, likewise, and there are behavioral risk factors that can contribute to adverse um, uh, maternal and child outcomes, such as smoking and alcohol use, that can be addressed uh, ideally prior to conception. And in particular, the diabetes and hypertension uh, risk factors um, can be completely asymptomatic, and women or birthing individuals may be unaware that they need assistance with bringing this into regulation before. Um, before they gain an encounter with, um, gain healthcare access and are able to become diagnosed, uh, which may come as a surprise. Um, so these are some of the key indicators that were identified by the National Preconception Health and Healthcare Initiative uh, that we, we look at. And then uh, another category of indicator that was identified by that initiative as being important for maternal and child health is uh, actually effective contraception use postpartum, um, given that birth spacing in and of itself can uh, present risks for subsequent pregnancies. So the policy that we're looking at in this paper is uh, expansion of Medicaid eligibility under the Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010 constitutes the largest change to the United States health policy in decades. And uh, this particular policy of the Medicaid eligibility expansion uh, is something that's very much still under discussion, uh, given that after 2012 Supreme Court decision uh, made it optional for the states rather than mandatory as originally uh, envisioned, um, States have been uh, weighing uh, one by one whether to uh, accept the federal funding for this policy and expand Medicaid eligibility to low-income adult, childless, you know, non-disabled adults, you know, adults without uh, additional quali specific qualifiers that, that have been relevant for Medicaid eligibility in the past. Uh, in this case, uh, low income uh, would, would be sufficient to gain access to Medicaid. Um, I'll show you a map uh, in just the next slide of which states have adopted uh, this policy up to this point, but it's uh, very much been a slow adoption with 27 states adopting the policy in uh, 2014, which was the earliest time that states could decide to uh, leverage federal funding to um, extend Medicaid eligibility to all low-income uh, adults, including those who are non-disabled, non-parents, etc. That created, we think, uh, an important shift for people uh, who ultimately became pregnant in terms of getting access to health care and being able to address uh, preconception risk factors prior to uh, prior to pregnancy. So uh, prior to 2014, prior to 
states having the option to to extend Medicaid coverage in this manner. Uh, Medicaid was chiefly available for for parents, um, for uh, pregnant women uh, with coverage ending uh, after pregnancy, after I believe a 60 day period. And uh, and was available for disabled uh, low income adults. So low income women in general in the preconception phase were largely ineligible. Uh, so to give a particular example, um, income eligibility thresholds uh, were low as well for women with children. The median state threshold eligibility for working parents in 2018, 20, pardon me, 2013 was 61 percent of the federal poverty level, which is quite low. And so that contributed to gaps in coverage and access to health services both before and after pregnancy. So remember that that can be relevant to not only um, the current pregnancy of folic acid or management of ongoing risk factors, but it also could be relevant um, for birth spacing for the next pregnancy, um, which can contribute in turn to maternal health later. So starting in 2014, for those states that did adopt the policy, individuals like I mentioned with it, household income under 138 percent of federal, federal poverty level were, were became eligible for Medicaid coverage. Uh, and then we do leverage the, the state level variation and uptake of this policy. So here's a map of uh, this is actually from 2020 of uh, states that have implemented the Affordable Care Act Medicaid eligibility expansions that I just described. Since then, there have there has been some movement on Nebraska, Missouri, and Oklahoma with uh, a court case going through in Missouri, and and now that uh, will be implemented in Missouri in the end. Oklahoma and Nebraska, I believe, starting this year, um, July and October, uh, people were able to uh, low income adults were able to get uh, Medicaid coverage. So that would be after the period that we are studying uh, in, in the data that were available at the time of the analysis. But as you can see that there are quite a number of states, um, uh, 39, uh, 12 that had not adopted a, a, uh, in this map, uh, Wisconsin being a specific case that I'm happy to talk about more. Um, and you can see the geographic concentration of the states that uh, elected not to adopt this policy as well. So why would this matter and, and, and uh, how, could, how could this policy help uh, improve preconception health? So there were several uh, prior studies that uh, provided the, the, the data that we thought supported the relevance of this policy uh, for preconception health. So uh, first of all, some uh, prior studies noticed that there was an increase in insurance coverage among low-income women, uh, in particular low-income women of reproductive age uh, in the states that adopted this policy. Um, as you might expect, given that some um, some uh, women would have had access to Medicaid as uh, parents, there were uh, larger increases in coverage among women without children. And there were also uh, evidence of, in the prior literature, there was evidence in e increased access to physicians, both before and after pregnancy, and co fewer cost-related barriers to care. Uh, finally, there were some uh, earlier analyses that found no change in health uh, indicators among uh, women of reproductive age, not necessarily focusing on women who ultimately became pregnant, um, such as BMI, smoking cessation, and chronic condition diagnosis. Um, though we, we thought uh, this was worth a closer look with uh, longer periods of data after the policy became enacted because some of these, there, you may expect two different effects here um, that access to health care may make women healthier. Uh, so for example, support them in smoking cessation um, or gaining a healthy weight. It will help them uh, just by increasing the affordability of health care and not having to pay out of pocket for medical bills. Um, Maybe possible to buy uh, healthier food and have access to healthier food in that in that way. Uh, but on the on the other hand, um, access to care will increase diagnosis of chronic conditions that people didn't know they had. So we thought this was worth following up with uh, additional years of data to see the full effect. Uh, there are some additional considerations that we um, took into account when designing the analysis. So uh, first being uh, this this issue of increased diagnosis versus increased um, prevention that is hard to tease apart uh, in, in a single self-report indicator. But also when thinking about preconception health um, 
it may be, it's important to consider that not all pregnancies are planned. And in fact, about a third are not intended at the time of conception. So um, we took a two tiered look at preconception health, uh, in part looking at women who ultimately did become pregnant and in part looking at data from women who could become pregnant because that's the pool from whom uh, women who ultimately became pregnant were drawn. Um, and, and not always um, in a way that was uh, premeditated, as I mentioned. So the research question for this paper is what were the impacts of the Affordable Care Act Medicaid eligibility expansions on these preconception health indicators? The 10 indicators uh, uh, were prioritized by the National Preconception Health and Healthcare Initiative. Uh, those were chosen because they were they could be monitored using existing data from uh, uh, CDC, and we used two CDC data sources. And then we also examined changes in health insurance coverage to provide context and show the plausibility um, that changes in coverage could account for our findings, although um, uh, that's only suggestive evidence. So the population studied, um, we uh, focused on people who identify as female and who um, would, would meet those income criteria of on, on lower than 138% uh, federal poverty level uh, household income. So the, the group targeted by the policy. Our study design was uh, differences and differences design. Um, so to break that down, what that means is that we examined data from before versus after um, the, the policy uh, for most states that was uh, 2014 that they chose to implement. Um, some states never chose to implement at all. And therefore we have this uh, second difference of comparing outcomes both before versus after and then in states that did versus did not adopt the policy during our um, period of observation, which ends in 2018. We adjusted for ongoing um, national trends. Of course, there were a lot of other important changes, uh, both economic policy, uh, et cetera, on the, uh, on, on the national level. So we wanted to adjust for those with the year indicators and also adjusted for state indicators um, to account for differences between these states. Looking at the map previously, you may have also noticed that um, this was not a random subsample of states and there are some enduring differences between states that did and did not adopt the policy. We also um, adjusted for uh, some time varying contextual variables like the unemployment rate. Um, some policies relevant to fertility decisions uh, in the PRAMS analysis because we know that only a selected group of women do become pregnant and that may be relevant to the policies in their state that may um, support uh, families and make it easier to start a family um, and may have changed over time in a way that happened may have happened to coincide for, with with this policy so we wanted to adjust for that we also adjust for women's uh, personal characteristics um, that may uh, affect how they respond um, uh, how, how they um, how healthcare impacts them and uh, we did sensitivity analyses uh, where we assess the plausibility of the assumptions underlying our analysis uh, to make sure that um, the key assumption we needed was that the two sets of states in the absence of this policy change would have continued along parallel trends in, in outcomes in terms of these preconception health indicators. And while that's impossible to test, um, the uh, showing that if we do see that they were progressing in parallel trends prior to the policy, that's evidence of the plausibility of this assumption. So we, we took a look at that as well. We also assessed changes in the composition of women giving birth to check the plausibility that that could be accounting for our results in the PRAMS data. So the, uh, there are the two data sources. As I hinted, we looked not only at women, all women of reproductive age, um, but also women who get, get, uh, with a recent birth. And that's in part because uh, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System uh, is specifically asks questions that are important to uh, preconception health that are not captured in general surveillance surveys, such as folic acid and postpartum uh, contraception. Um, so in, in the BRFS, BRFSS, that was the data source we used to uh, look at uh, indicators from all women of reproductive age as recommended by the CDC. It's representative of non-institutionalized adults and has data on, uh, in our case, the preconception and in health indicators of diabetes, depression, hypertension, smoking, healthy weight, and exercise. Uh, 
Um, the PRAMS data, um, it, it does have, uh, it, uh, while the BRFSS is available for every state, the PRAMS is not. Uh, there, we, um, there were fewer states. Um, we uh, selected the sample to make sure that states weren't um, entering and leaving the sample because that might account for our results. So that left us with a sample of 13 states that were um, had available data every year that we were looking at, eight expansion and non five non-expansion states. And the key outcomes there were unwanted pregnancy, whether the, the pregnancy that did happen was, was wanted or not at the time, uh, prenatal vitamin use and postpartum use of effective contraception defined as sterilization or an implant, intrauterine device, injectable pill patch or vaginal ring. So here are data on the baseline characteristics of, uh, of the uh, uh, people who lived in uh, the, the two states, people in the sample. So first in the BRFSS, uh, the women of reproductive age, we looked at data from 2011 through 2013, and you can see the sample sizes here. Um, you can see that a smaller proportion of women in the states um, in the sample were Hispanic in the non-expansion states compared to expansion states. And um, looking at the characteristics of women with a recent live birth in the in the PRAMS data, um, we can find that there is uh, uh, women with a recent live birth were younger in non-expansion than in expansion states. So. Uh, definitely underscoring the point that these um, the samples in these two groups of states are different. Um, that doesn't undermine the validity of the study as long as we have that key assumption that uh, outcomes would have evolved similarly, um, uh, either trending upward or downward in the same way uh, in these two groups of states. So um, this is provided for, for context on the sample. So here we start to uh, show you some of the results. Uh, of our key um, preconception health indicators and how those changed in association with the Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansions being adopted in a given state um, with, in the case of a PRAMS, a one-year lag to allow for the timing of pregnancy itself. Um, the, you know, the um, fact that the preconception period was, uh, was about one year prior to the pregnancy and uh, data collection, the, the, the delivery and data collection. Um, and what we find is that there is no significant change in the health indicators of women of reproductive age, which could indicate um, uh, which could indicate uh, changes in health potentially uh, co-occurring with changes in diagnosis rates, uh, or could indicate that this takes some time. For example, um, our confidence intervals do include some meaningful values, but we just uh, can't rule out zero. Uh, for women with a recent live birth, we do find, as the title suggests, uh, it's a health affairs paper, they like the punchline in the title, uh, that there was an increase in preconception health counseling, folic acid intake, and unwanted, oh, pardon me, no change in unwanted pregnancy, uh, increase in po postpartum use of effective contraception. We do find some changes in Medicaid coverage that suggest the plausibility of these findings. Um, we also find evidence to support these parallel trends assumption uh, that is needed for the analysis, at least um, uh, using the pre-period data. So in summary, what were the impacts of the Affordable Care Act Medicaid eligibility expansions among low-income women of reproductive age? Uh, we found increases in coverage in both the pre-pregnancy period and the postpartum period, increases that were uh, pretty substantial, 8 to 11 percentage points. We saw increases in uh, relevant healthcare utilization as, as identified by National Task Force. Increases in a preconception health visit where people could, for example, um, do testing for um, underlying health conditions, risk factors, and try to address them prior to pregnancy. Uh, increases in effective contraception after pregnancy. And then we also saw uh, improvement in one health risk factor, specifically folic acid consumption, which is so important for preventing neural tube defects. Um, so, so uh, to to briefly conclude, I know I'm almost at time here. Uh, we think that these findings are important because the preconception health visit um, can uh, allow uh, providers to help and working together with patients to help plan to address key health issues that affect approximately half of pregnancies in the United States, um, as well as uh, I, I've already mentioned the importance of these other two indicators. Um, we think that it's important to keep revisiting this question to uh, try to better understand the lack of change in other health risk factors uh, or diagnoses um, in, in the, 
about five years after the policy that we are able to examine. Um, we do think that these might change over time um, in, in a meaningful way, and it's worth keeping a pulse on that issue. And this is important for current policy debates. Um, the, the current policy debate in Wisconsin has already been mentioned. Um, state level discussions on Medicaid expansion have been certainly ongoing here, um, despite a partial implementation of a state funded expansion earlier. Um, and then there's the uh, expanded postpartum coverage bill um, that has been under consideration as well. Um, again, it's been a delight to present this work to you, and um, I will be happy to take your questions and uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marison. Um, we have about one or two minutes. Um, I know it's very short, um, but I do see a question. It looks like from Emily Thorson in the chat. I'm curious as to if you think having a previous stillbirth or abortion would change any data or produce different results. Having a, um, so we weren't able, let's see. So I, I think um, maybe the question is whether if we subset of the data to looking at people who had a previous stillbirth or abortion, would this be differentially meaningful, the, this, this change in access to coverage be differentially meaningful for that population? Um, I, I guess I can't say because it's beyond what we could do in the data. And I would also, as a non-clinician, definitely believe, <laughs> believe that um, uh, how, how it uh, it would be outside of probably my scope of expertise and very much in the scope of expertise of others in the audience to know whether access to health care uh, would be more important in terms of uh, affecting that as a specific preconception health risk factor uh, for, for that group uh, that, than other groups. It's something that we weren't able to look at in our data. Thank you. Um, there are some additional links um, provided in the chat that um, folks can check out. Um, I'm sad that we're short on time and didn't have more uh, question time, but um, so appreciative of everyone's talks and um, the information shared today um, has, has been really enlightening for me and I, I think everyone in the audience. Um, I am going to be turning it back over to Dr. Sarto for some closing uh, remarks. Dr. Sarto. <clears throat> well, thank you, and and uh, what a wonderful day. It was uh, just great. I, and uh, I want to thank uh, all of you who are attending the conference, and certainly thanks to Dr. Howell, who so aptly described and defined what is needed if we are to reduce the marked racial and ethnic disparities that exist in maternal and child health. Something we all would like to see, obviously. And thanks to Dr. Tampkin and Dr. Myerson, both of whom are continuing to address some aspects of social determinants of health and racial and ethnic differences uh, that exist in terms of uh, seeking care and how it and relates to outcomes. I want to call attention to uh, those individuals who are willing to set up their posters and share their research endeavors with us. And we'll be talking about the, the posters in just a, a bit, because we have uh, the posters were uh, reviewed and judged, and uh, we have the results of that, and we will present that. Uh, I want to recognize uh, some of the members of the committee, uh, including uh, Dr. Rice, Autumn, obviously, uh, Carol Holland, uh, Lisa Scott, and Melody Bachenfeld, and Cheryl Grant. And to really to thank, uh, particular thanks to Autumn, uh, who did such a remarkable job in getting this all together. Thanks again, and thanks so much for coming to, and to this conference. Appreciate it. <laughs>